Well, brothers and sisters, this morning we are starting chapter three of our series uh, on Mark, the Gospel of Mark. And today is um, really a time where Jesus highlights, uh, highlights choices, important choices. And there becomes a really clear distinction between uh, what is good and, and what Jesus is offering to people versus what is uh, not Jesus and not good and not according to the heart of the gospel. But before we dive into the details of that, let's uh, look at the scriptures. We're reading chapter 3 of the Gospel of Mark. So I invite you to open up your Bibles or follow along on the screen. I'm not sure whether I will have the verses up there, but I hope to. I plan to. Um, but uh, follow along, please, with chapter 3 of the Gospel of Mark. Another time, he went into the synagogue, that is Jesus, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, asked them, excuse me, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to them, <clears throat> said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, uh, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him, for he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To him, to them he gave the name bon, Bonerges, Bonerges, don't know how to pronounce that, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob the house. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, 
he is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers? he asked. Then he looked around at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we get into those things that I mentioned earlier, we need to unpack a couple of little details that, that sometimes uh, throw people off about this passage. And uh, so we need to, first of all, the first thing we're going to look at is chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, this is important because the Herodians were people who were in favor of King Herod, but also who were, uh, they kind of wanted to accept and adopt, become part of the larger Greco-Roman culture. And so in a lot of ways, the Pharisees and the Herodians were just as opposed, if not more opposed to each other normally than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They, they, were, they were in some ways polar opposites. But Mark here points out that, that the situation as they see it, as both of these parties see it, is so dire that they will even work with their enemy. Right? That old saying, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? <clears throat> they have decided that Jesus is an enemy. And why is that? Well, one is because remember there's this connection between Jesus and John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had, uh, had yelled at, uh, virtual, or yelled at uh, Herod for uh, inappropriate marriage. And so Herod was not a big fan of John the Baptist, so much so that he got John the Baptist, uh, he killed him. Um, and so that was not good. But Jesus is very much associated with John the Baptist. And so Herod and his followers, those who approve of Herod and so on and so forth, they, they don't really like Jesus very much either. And the Pharisees as well, they have been increasingly concerned about Jesus. In fact, we, we read here a little bit later that, uh, that there are leaders, religious leaders, coming all the way up from Jerusalem in the, in the sort of southern part of, uh, of Israel, all the way up to uh, Galilee where Jesus is preaching, they're so concerned they're having people come up and, and sort of check out this Jesus fellow, right? And so the Pharisees and the Herodians here are plotting together how they might get rid of Jesus. And part of that is because Jesus is increasingly making it clear that there is a polarized choice here. Now, I hesitate very much to talk about black and white choices in a lot of situations, uh, about, you know, this is the right thing or the wrong thing, right? Just like your political leanings, it's right to be uh, conservative and wrong to be liberal or wrong to be conservative and right to be liberal or anything like that. That's not where the scriptures take us, generally speaking. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, each sort of political viewpoint has its own merits and, and all that kind of stuff. And you could say the same about a lot of different things in this world. 
But <laughs> there are some things like whether or not you accept Jesus as the Son of God that really do come down to either a, a yea or a nay, a yes or a no. And in this chapter, this is where we see the choices issue coming out. But again, before we get there, there are a couple other things we need to touch on and clarify. We need to look at verse 10 and 11 and 12 of chapter 3, uh, particularly 11 and 12. Whenever the evil spirits, these are the evil spirits that Jesus is casting out, whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Now, this is that uh, theme that we talked about before throughout the Gospel of Mark of the messianic secret, right? Jesus is actually there uh, to, to proclaim the good news of God's favor, God's love, of the Father showing his love to this world. And, and he, he doesn't want until the time is right for that uh, that idea of Jesus as the Son of God to be um, to become the central focus, right? Uh, if you imagine like a, a, a good story it is one where you've got uh, the rising action, the the plot goes up and things get more and more intense until you reach the climax at which you know uh, the things are most intense and, and all the problems come to a head. And then you've got the denouement where, where things are explained and wrapped up in a neat, uh, neat bow uh, in a traditional sort of story. Jesus is building the story. <clears throat> he wants people to focus on how um, God loves them and how God sent Jesus with a authority and power so that his credentials are, are demonstrated for the world to see. And then when the time is right, when the climax comes, which is when he is uh, arrested and put on trial and crucified, when that happens, then all will be revealed finally and we will know for sure, the messianic secret will no longer be secret. So just remember that, again, Jesus is commanding these demons not to reveal him, not because ultimately the, the reality of Jesus as the Messiah is secret, but because the time is not right for that. And then next, we wanted to highlight for example, this, uh, this story of Jesus and his mothers and brothers. But I think we're going to do that. Um, we're going to do that towards the end. All right. So it's about choices, brothers and sisters. And the key passage or the key verses in this whole passage about these choices is really when Jesus talks about whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, people have wrestled with this for a long time. They have wrestled with what is the sin, the unforgivable sin, the sin that cannot be forgiven and will be, uh, you know, it is an eternal sin as Jesus describes it. However, this whole passage and, and the context here and including what Jesus talks about uh, in this particular incident where the Pharisees accuse him of driving out demons by an, the power of an evil spirit, this whole passage lets us in to the ultimate reason why there is a, a, an eternal sin and what that sin is. 
You see, the reality is that more and more, Jesus is making it clear that at some point, you need to choose which side you are on. You need to choose which side you are on. And so, really, when the Pharisees declare that the spirit within Jesus is actually a demon, they are declaring themselves to be opposed to the Holy Spirit. That very spirit who the Bible tells us comes into our hearts and works to soften them so that we might receive the good news of Jesus as our Savior. It is as if God is reaching out to us, reaching out to the Pharisees and every human being who has ever been, reaching out with a hand of love, the hand of the Holy Spirit, reaching out to us, and we slap that hand away, and the Pharisees slap that hand away and say, evil, evil. Throughout this passage, throughout chapter 3 and, and before that and after that, more and more Jesus is clarifying that there is, is a good and a bad here. And it is not what the Pharisees think. In fact, they are on completely the wrong side on this. Look at the first little segment, this story of the shriveled, the man with the shriveled hand. Right? Jesus says to the people in the synagogue, Jesus says to them, is it good to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? He makes it so clear. It is not a choice in that moment. Jesus is saying it is not a choice of, you know, vague religious interpretations of Scripture or whatever. It's not about the nuances of the law. It's not about, um, you know, whether you're, you're, you're dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's, theologically speaking. No, no, no. It really comes down to, Jesus says, good and bad, good and evil, right and wrong. Is it good to save life? on the Sabbath, or to do evil, to kill. And then as we move on, right, we have the story of Jesus and driving out the demons, and we see how he constantly makes that choice to save and help them. And then moving on some more, <coughs> excuse me, we see that Jesus appoints the 12. They have chosen, and he has chosen them, they have chosen to follow Jesus. And so they are given authority to drive out demons in his name and through his power. And then we move on and we see that unlike the disciples, the apostles who are appointed and follow him, the, the, the leaders who are sent up from Jerusalem and Jesus' family at that time, although we know that Mary at least uh, comes to understand more about who Jesus is, but Jesus shows their, their willingness to follow, or lack thereof, in sharp contrast to the disciples, the apostles that he has chosen. And he says to them, ultimately, there is only a choice between me or other. There is only a choice between Jesus following the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the great three-in-one God, the great I am, or not.
the Pharisees accused Jesus of driving out demons by demonic power. Jesus' family says he, say he's crazy and that he needs to be brought under control. In both cases, they are making choices against God. So too it is with us, brothers and sisters, and everybody else in this world. Now, I don't know, you don't know, nobody knows when exactly that final choice will need to be made. Will it be uh, today? Will it be tomorrow? Will it be the day after? Will it be, you know, uh, for those who have not heard, will God confront them after they have died and say, hey, look, this is the real story and now you need to make a choice? Nobody knows that except for God, but there is a choice. There is a choice. Will you choose to sin, to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit by denying the good work of the Holy Spirit and denying the salvation that is offered through Jesus Christ? Or will you accept the relationship that God wants to have with you? Now, there are those in this world who would claim that that is unfair, that that is exclusivity, that that is, uh, somehow, um, that is somehow driving people away. And you can sort of understand that. I mean, part of the reality is that the church has often packaged together all kinds of other choices with the gospel message that are not good. The reality is, is that the church has, ever since like the Crusades, has come and said, hey, you either convert or else. Or, um, you know, you, the church has often said, hey, look, if you're going to become a Christian, then that means that you need to look a certain way and you need to act a certain way. I, I remember there is this horrible, horrible cover of the Banner magazine where, uh, where it shows Navajo people from the southern U.S. Uh, and, it, and it shows a picture on the cover that says, before the gospel, and it shows the Navajo person in their, in their uh, traditional uh, dress. And then it says, after the gospel, and it shows a picture of a Navajo family with their hair cut like Europeans, with clothes like Europeans, sitting nice and neatly and tidily in a row, with Bibles in their laps and so on, as if somehow believing the gospel means looking like a European. And that is part of the sin of not only our denomination, that, that's us, but it's also part of the sin of the Christian church in this world. And so it's understandable that sometimes many people, they have this impression that the Christian message requires all kinds of things that it does not, and that therefore it is really ultimately a hateful, empirical, arrogant message. We need to repent of that as a denomination and as Christ followers throughout the world. It is also true, however, that once all of our sin is stripped away, there is a real choice to be made. A choice between the love of God and our own pride and independence. And it is not exclusive. It is profoundly inclusive. 
in that God holds out the hand of salvation. God holds out the Holy Spirit. God holds out his son, Jesus Christ, to us. God holds out the truth to us, to every person who has ever been or is or will ever be equally. God holds it out to all of us. And God does not require us to be European. And God does not require us to be male or female. God does not require us to be straight or homosexual. God does not require us to be black, white, brown, or any other color. God does not require of us that we be from Southeast Asia. God does not require of us that we be from Africa. God does not require any of those things. God loves those beautiful and diverse and wonderful things. And God has mercy for all of us, regardless of our baggage or our struggles or our sins. So God holds it out equally to all of us and sends his Holy Spirit to soften us up. But he does not force God does not force us. God does not say to us, convert, or I'll make you convert. He gives us the choice. Now, how does that work with predestination, you might ask? Well, maybe we'll get to that in a later message. I'm not sure. Uh, But somehow there is this tension, this reality that God chooses us and we choose him. What we need to know today is that ultimately, each one of us is presented with the choice. Who are my mother and brother and my brothers? Jesus says to us. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Brothers and sisters, we have choices. Are we going to, today, do God's will? If you have not made the choice to follow Jesus, or if you have walked away from him, and, you know, maybe it's been hard because we haven't been together to hold one another accountable or encourage one another. If you have walked away, God is calling you back, saying, will you do? my will? Will you be my mother or sister or brother? Will you do good or evil? Will you save life or kill? Brothers and sisters, today, let us choose life again. Let us choose life for the first time if we never have before. And let us remember to give the truth of the choice that is being offered to those around us. Not the baggage. Not the, all the other junk that often comes with. But instead, the choice to receive God's love or reject it. Let us pray. Father in, Father in, in heaven, we are reminded that we don't know when our final choice will need to be made. But we do know that we do have choices to make. And that every person who ever has been or ever will be, every person who is, will likewise have choices to make. 
we confess, O God, that often we have packaged your gospel together with all kinds of stuff that is meaningless and contrary to the heart of your gospel, just like the Pharisees did when they packaged together the Sabbath with not healing and not doing good. Forgive us for that, please. Help us to reconcile with those whom we have hurt through that. And Lord, please, Help us to choose to do good, to choose to do your will, O God, to be Jesus' brothers and sisters and mothers. Father, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.